Canon A1 is an advanced level single lens reflex or SLR 35mm film camera. It is an enthusiast camera, probably one step below Canon F1. It is a highly desirable camera for use by any enthusiast in 2023 and beyond. It's easy to use, it has all the features you want, it looks great and um, it has a very important position in the history of SLR camera development. Canon A1 came out in 1978. In the line of Canon A cameras, AE1 came out in 1976, AT177, this one A178, AV179, AE1 program 81 and AL1 in 82. One year before, in uh, 1977, Minolto XD came out with electronic control exposure modes including aperture priority, shutter priority and full manual mode but it didn't have the program mode that A1 introduced for the first time in SLR cameras. Today almost every camera, film or digital is expected to have the full PASM mode, automatic program, aperture priority, shutter priority and full manual. But back then, having the full range of PASM was a breakthrough by Canon. Canon A1 is about 620 grams, feels solid in the hand, it takes Canon FD lenses of which more than 50 were available back then and even now they are very affordable and very high quality. Let's look at all the features systematically. From the top, we find uh, some of the familiar elements, the film advanced lever in the usual position, but a few other things are quite unusual. On the left side you find a very big dial for the ISO setting. In order to turn this wheel for the ISO, you have to press this little tab over here and then turn it. It can be a bit fiddly, but it makes sure that you don't accidentally move it around. Now it's on 200 ASA or ISO. The shutter release button is over here and it has a cable release slot in the middle. In the center we have the hot shoe and any modern flash should work. Most of the features are on the right hand side and I'll describe each one of them to you. First you have to choose whether you want P, A, S or M. First I'll go with aperture priority or A. A, V is the mode that you want. You turn this wheel to A, V. A dial here will come up that shows your aperture. In the front, there is a wheel, as you can see here, there's a wheel here, which like very modern cameras, you can turn with your finger and you can adjust to whatever aperture you want. So what happens to the aperture ring of the lens? Well, you put it on A as in automatic, you lock it into A and everything else is done by the body. You can take it off the A if you want to use it in the manual mode but for all the other automatic modes you leave it on the A. So that gives you aperture priority. It means that the camera will choose the shutter speed for you. We'll come to that in a minute. So if you want to go for shutter priority mode you turn the same wheel one more time and now the same dial amazingly turns into the shutter speeds which gives you a very good range. From one thousandth of a second, it goes through the full range of speeds, 30, 15, 8, 4, then 2, 1, 2 seconds, 4 seconds, 8 seconds, 15 seconds, and 30 seconds, and bulb. That's a very good range. Now, before 1000, you also have this setting called P. Now, that is the program mode. So, if you want shutter priority, you put it on any of these shutter speeds that you want. If you want to go to the next mode, which is uh, 
program mode, just put it on P. So shutter is now automatic, aperture is also automatic, therefore you're automatically in the P mode. So now you know the three modes, P, A, and S. For manual, you can just put this on any shutter you like, put the lens on any aperture you like, and there it is, that's your manual. How simple can it be? So there's no need for yet another dial like many other cameras. The one dial chooses either aperture or exposure and program as well. It's amazing that other cameras have not copied this. This camera has stepless shutter speeds. That means in the automatic mode, you're not bound by just these shutter speeds. If you put it in the AV mode, which is aperture priority, where it chooses the shutter speed by itself, anything in between the speeds, somewhere between say 500 and 1000, the camera will choose automatically. So its exposure mode is super accurate and I can vouch for that, it's amazing. The camera has uh, exposure compensation on the left hand side on the same dial as the ISO setting. But to choose it, you have to press this button over here, this button over here, and turn the wheel itself. The numbers may be a little confusing, but you get used to it. For example, on the left side, the default setting is 1 rather than 0. Okay, you have to get used to that. And then when it says 2 and 4, it doesn't mean 2 stops and 4 stops. Actually, it means 1 stop. That means twice the light and another stop four times the light with one third in between. So once you get used to that, just read it as one stop and two stop and one third in between. On the right hand side, we have this dial over here, which is currently on A. A for basically on. L for lock means off. You can continue with the same dial to go to 2, that means 2 second delay timer or 10 second. All of those modes on the one dial. Furthermore, there's another little tab over here. If you press that, you can do multiple exposure. That means when you press that, you wind, you're only cocking the shutter, not advancing the film at all. So better not touch that one. Underneath this, we have the film counter over here. When you push this back, it's partially covered, but doesn't matter. The camera takes Canon FD lenses. This is an FD lens. So the way you take it off is that chrome ring, you turn it to the left and comes out. Locks in position. When you put it back on, match that red dot to the red dot on the body of the camera and turn it right. The lens will not move. Just turn the ring and it's tight. This particular lens is a good one. It's a 50 millimeter 1.4 and uh, it has been film tested. It's an excellent lens. On the left side there's a slider. It does nothing except protect that rotating element over there. So if you want to go for the full P mode, which is by way of reminder, you do this, go to the TV mode, shutter priority mode, and then turn this wheel into P when you do that. And when this is on the A, you have nothing else to decide except to compose and shoot. At that point, you might like to protect this so it doesn't accidentally move from the P. So you push this up and there's nothing to do. On the right hand side of the camera, there are no other features. There is no mirror lockup, for example. This tab over here rotates up. Let me show you. This comes up 90 degrees. When you press it in, it is intended for depth of field. So the, the aperture ring has to be in the manual mode, whatever you want. And then you press that in. That gives you the preview inside the viewfinder. 
you find two adjacent buttons. This one, with a ring around it, is an exposure preview button, which duplicates the function of the shutter half press. Both of those are the same. So what's this for? This works in conjunction with this one, which is a exposure lock. So once you do a preview of your exposure, you're happy with it, you can then press this one and lock it in. Then you can recompose. For example, there's an object on the left side that you want to capture, but the lighting should be adjusted for something else, for the average or somewhere else on the picture. So you test it over here when you're happy with it, then you lock it here, then you recompose and take the shot. Here's a cap over the PC sync cable in case you want to use it instead of the shoe. There's a lever on, on this side around the battery check. It's a related function. In this mode, when that white dot is visible, it means that the inside the viewfinder, the LED is on. When you turn it off, the LED is off, so it doesn't use that battery. Here, in case you didn't know, this symbol means that exactly where that line is, that is where the film plane is inside the camera. On the right hand side, we have an action grip that's called an action grip. And this comes off. I'll take it off with one of these coins and a tip. These coins that are hexagonal or octagonal are better to use than the round ones. Okay, this comes off, slides in that direction, slides and comes off. So use something like this, the kitchen skewer, and press the little tab over there, and this opens out. This camera uses four LR44 batteries. If you have any problems finding four LR44, look at this video which we've done. There's a way of modifying four times little LR44s to fit into this perfectly, no problem. In order to test this camera further, we'll put a new one in, this time from Kodak. I'm sure it's badged as Kodak. Positive is on the left, negative is on the right. The best thing is to put the negative side in first because there's a pressure tab over there. If you put it the other way, you'll be bending that tab. So put the negative side in first, press it in, fits right in, push it down. And because I'm going to be very, very careful with this camera, I'm not going to just press it in. I'm going to press that button in first and then let it go down. Okay. Put this tab on the A, which is the on button, and press this button over here, it rapidly blinks. That means battery is perfect. Also to test it, we can put it in TV mode, take it off the P, put it on one of the high speeds, say 1250, and press the shutter, perfect. So. On the back, we have the viewfinder, very uncluttered, beautiful, with LED lights, easy to see. On the left side of this, there's a shutter for the viewfinder, as you can see, closes it, to stop the light leaks from this side going in, in case you're using a tripod. Put the film tab over here to remember the ISO. Let's look at the bottom of it, tripod hole is here. Film rewind button is over here. This is not a battery chamber. Don't try to open it with a coin. These two are for motor winder. That's the electrical connection. That is a actual turning knob. Back to the top. Let's see what we can do to open up the back. First, you open the film rewind, pull this out, and 
pop it further, the back opens. It's a cloth shutter, so it's not as advanced as some of the later cameras which were metal shutters vertically operating. It's a horizontally operating shutter, but it has a very reassuring feel. It doesn't feel delicate, it feels solid. And the sound is great. You put the film in like any 70s, 80s SLR, stretch the film across here, put it into any of those many, many holes you find there. Advance a little bit while trying to engage with those sprockets in this wheel over here. It's perfectly good. And close this, ready to go. You advance a couple of times until it gets to the orange mark over there, and that's good to go. This camera feels great in the hand. The grip is very useful. Like any modern camera, the grip is uh, just in the right place. With one of your preferred automatic modes, it should work very rapidly. You will not miss any shots. I highly recommend, if you can afford to get one of these for a couple of hundred dollars, get one in mint condition like this one. You will not regret it. As a film camera, there are not many better than this one. This is in the same league and feels just as good as many of the Nikon cameras of uh, this kind of enthusiast range, like um, a Nikon FM, FM2N, FM3, uh, except this one has a lot more advanced features, the PASM mode and so on. By the time the other cameras brought out these features, they become a bit uh, convoluted. This one has done it very well. Canon A1 came a couple of years after Canon AE1, which is this one. Since then, Canon AE1 has become a cult classic. And Canon A1 hasn't. In fact, they're both based on the same chassis. They have the same kind of uh, basic features, but this one has a lot more. If I had a choice, I would get a Canon A1 over AE1 any day. And I've used both of these in every situation. Let's compare them front and back. You can see the similarities. Look at the bottom. Also very similar. Size. Identical because they have the same basic chassis different fittings inside and outside. So Canon A1 is Canon AE1++. You could pass Canon A1 today as a very modern camera. Don't you agree? Which one is more vintage? This camera from 2020 or this Canon AE1? This is a fairly modern digital camera 43 years ago two years ago one reason they're not as expensive as some other cameras is that they don't look truly vintage this might look vintage this looks modern it has the same design clues as some other cameras which were heavily electronic. For example, this beautiful Contax RTS. Can you see the design clues? You can see the way Pentaprism started getting rectangular as opposed to, say, this. See? Almost all cameras had this particular geometry of Pentaprism. This is a Nikkor mat. The same kind of geometry of pentaprism. But at some point, it switched over to this more streamlined rectangular look. A more serious looking, almost like a sports mode. So Canon A1 is iconic.
as a piece of design has a very important in the history of camera development. Go and get one. Now let's look at some film tests.